How you guys doing? Let's talk about projecting plate races. Now I know they don't use restrictor plates anymore, but I'm speaking specifically for Daytona and Talladega. And there is a lot of information on this subject. I have talked about this for hours over the years, and I love talking about it. I was going to wait to do more of these leading up to the Daytona 500, but I just figured I'd just do more then. I'd rather talk about this stuff now. I'd rather just make more content around this stuff now. Um, I originally, entering this year, when I came over to True DFS, I wanted to make a playlist of my old videos on this type of subject, and I did. I ended up calling it the DFS Master Class for the Super Speedways and stuff. And some people might find, you know, that name stupid and stuff like that. But I haven't seen this type of coverage from anybody else over the years in terms of having the passion for this, digging deep into it, looking at different data sets over, you know, different years and stuff. And so I went ahead and, and made a playlist from my channels or my my personal channels old videos and it's roughly around like seven hours long okay now i understand some people might not have the time to do that which it's the off season you should have time to listen to seven hours of content over the course of like three four weeks at this point before we get to the 500 uh and maybe you maybe you don't want to dive into that maybe you want a starting point that's kind of what this video is going to be and it's and it's it, it's kind of a general uh topic of Guys, realistically, it's pretty easy to project plate races, okay? As, 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 you know, title grabbing as that sounds, that's really what I want to talk about here. And the importance that I believe you have hand building, oops, hand building over using an optimizer, um, playing certain ways and not playing other ways and stuff like that. And so, like, first and foremost, everybody understands the whole stack the back strategy, or you've at least heard of that. When we go to these races, and we're going to talk about stuff here as we kind of continue along. When we look at plate races, and we look at these races here, now these are going all the way back. You don't need to use all this data. Like, we don't need to pull from, like, 97 and stuff. But if you remember, I talked about this from the Atlanta race. When we're looking at, really, the last 10-ish years, we'll go back to, like, 2011 uh, if we need to. But really, looking back at the last years... And we look at the percentage of, of positions being optimal and where the optimal positions come from. Now, this is going all the way back to when we had a 43-card field, so we can kind of move that up or kind of disregard that, whatever you want to do. But when we look at where the optimal lineups come from, we see a big number of them coming from, you know, the back half of the field, a.k.a. stack the back. And now people want to, you know, argue and, and you know, just be like, well, you need, actually, realistically, the optimal lineup is going to have 2.3 drivers from positions 23 to 14, probably 3.86 drivers from, like, we don't need that type of uh, analysis, at least in my opinion. When I look at this type of stuff, and I look at how these races are playing out, and we talked about this specifically kind of with Atlanta. Now, this is um, this is Daytona. We do have Cup, or we do have uh, Talladega here, and we'll talk about this stuff as we kind of go along through this, but when we look at the um, the DNF percentages in these races here, this is just Daytona, and I like to use them together, but for this, for these sheets, I do have them separated and stuff, and thank you yet again for uh, ASC for pulling this data for me during the offseason, so I didn't have to. Yet again, since I've covered all this stuff over the years, I just got rid of my old sheets and stuff that I had, because I'm like, all right, I already know this information, I don't need to go back and look at it, but for those that are like wanting to look at this stuff either for the first time or something i i had to get i had to get this stuff somehow um but when we look at the amount of uh dnfs that we have in these races and yet again this is daytona when we look at the amount of dnfs at talladega and we see this is kind of going back uh, more and this is kind of in a different uh segment this is just kind of percentage of total in, in general and you and this has the uh, the dnf starting positions here and we can use this as, you know, an argument against stacking, stack, stacking all drivers from the back. Anyway, we, we have a lot of information here. But for the most part, we're seeing a lot of DNFs. We're seeing wrecks can happen anywhere at any time. You know, the optimal lineup, the top 12 scoring guys are going to be crazy no matter what happens and, and things of that nature. When, when I view this stuff, this is like, okay, cool, man. Realistically, just starting out in terms of easy to project how drivers are going to do. You know, I made a video last year, the year before, talking about film study and actually paying attention to how people approach these track, approach these uh, races from the driver's standpoint, 
not looking at finishing position, not looking at starting position, but how drivers navigate through, how drivers are performing in the races. You typically see the same drivers up front in these races or having the skill to get up front in these races. You know, you can think of Joey Logano. You can think of Denny Hamlin. You can think of Justin Haley, guys that come to your mind of people who are like, yeah, these guys are good at these at these races. Now, the finishes might not always show that, and we can, you know, we can look at that. You know, we could look at the super speedways here. We can look at restricted plate races, look at the last 10 and just get the rankings here, and this is going to give you a good idea of, wow, these guys don't DNF a lot, or wow, these guys can actually finish here. Like, if you're getting top 10s consistently, so what is this, 10 races, last two and a half years, 60% top 10, 60% top 10, 50% top 10. And you look at Blaney, and you're like, wow, this guy actually finishes. He actually runs up well. This is, finishing position, in my opinion, is not the important factor to play here. It's going to play, it's going to be a factor when we look at how projections are made and people are looking at spreadsheets and stuff. But how is Ryan Blaney getting in these situations? How is he getting such good finishes? Is he just getting lucky? Is he racing up there all day? What's going on here? That's the type of stuff that I really try and focus on. Like, yet again, for example, when we're making projections for the Daytona 500 in a couple weeks, these are the favorites. These are the people who are good, good, good ish at finishing races. Okay? I brought up Denny Hamlin. You know, where is Denny Hamlin here? We're not seeing him. Has he DNF'd a lot? What's going on? He only has three top 10 finishes here. Let's see how many races he's actually finishing. Oh, wow. He's actually finishing the majority of these races. He's being pushed out late in them due to green-white checkers. But when we look at average running position, which I don't believe that is running that fit. We don't have average running position here. Um, when we're looking at these races, you're typically going to see the same guys either run up front and stay up front and be up there all day and then get caught up in a late race crash you know and so when i'm looking at projecting drivers on how to do well or how they're going to perform and stuff like that that's what i base it off of i never base it off of where these guys are finishing are they still running at the finish like we can if we just click on that we're going to see you know bj mcleod hey good finish you like he's running at the finish of the last 10 races okay that that's good to see now the the finishes might not be there, but he's not being involved in crashes. Same thing with, uh, who is it? Truex, who is notoriously a bad plate racer, has finished the last 10 races without an issue. Now, he has not finished that well, but he's finishing these races and stuff. And, well, without issue, he's probably an asterisk because he has been involved in Rex, but he doesn't. he's not wrecking out of these, these races and stuff. And so when we're building projections, and yet again, this is building off of all the years and videos and experience of going through this, these data points and data sets, and when, when, when I'm building projections and when I'm trying to approach it, you have to approach it two different ways, okay? When we're looking at projections-wise, I typically focus on it in two different factors or in two different ways. One, you can build the projections the way it should be. And what I mean by that is you build, or at least I build, because I manually build my projections and everything, I manually build them by how these individual drivers should finish in a race without any yellows, any incident, skill alone, that's how I project people for. And that's usually a good indicator, indicator, indication of ownership. For example, now the only one I have access to are is the Talladega uh, spring race last year. But here's an example. So when we're looking at how these guys are doing, and we look at the amount of ownership that these guys are carrying. Yet again, red is bad, green is good. And this is the uh, the big contest, you know. When you look at the starting grid and you go through and look at people, you see like, oh, yeah, Denny Hamlin's starting first. He should finish first. He's the bet he's the best plate racer there. Hey, Ryan Blaney's starting fifth. He should be he should finish up there. He's going to finish certainly ahead of these three individuals. Christopher Bell, Truex, Joe Gibbs cars, most likely to be running up front, or at least in the top 12. And then you just go on from there. Like Chris Buescher, probably going to finish well. We might want to play him. Bubba Wallace, going to work with Denny Hamlin, going to be up front all day, probably going to finish well, et cetera, et cetera. When you start getting back here, hey, Brad Keselowski, a driver who has a ton of talent who's going to be up there with Chris Buescher all day. And then you just go through and set all these guys there. Hey, Stenhouse, he's going to wreck everybody or win the race and finish very well. You have to project him up there. Like, 
in my opinion, building projections is fucking easy for these races, okay? When you don't consider the crashes or anything, because the crashes are so important, they just don't matter. When you have 60% of the field DNFing, well then, you know, calculating the DNF rate of this individual driver in this race, you know, simmed a thousand times or whatever, it doesn't even matter. Where, where, what, where does he rank in skill level, in how likely he is to do well, okay? And that's typically what drives ownership especially in the back of the field hey we look at Corey LaJoy who has been optimal like 38,000 times at Talladega and Daytona because he usually starts in the back he has bad qualifying he's able to finish races in the top 15 we have to project Corey LaJoy to has like a 16th 15th place finish and you see the ownership typically follows that regardless of if people want to argue that or not we see that Stenhouse was owned we see that LaJoy was owned we see that Chase Elliott was owned we see that the other Hendrick car was owned. Todd Gillen, a man who has started to be optimal quite a lot in this exact starting position, is optimal. We have Chastain, Jones. We have Keselowski, McDowell, who has just won the Daytona 500, who has finished well. We have Kyle Busch, another Hendrick car up here. Okay, and so you highlight all the drivers, and you look at all the drivers like this is a I don't understand what the fuck people are looking at with, this, with Haley here. But you look at how people are playing them, and it's like, well, yeah, all these guys are would be projected to do well. All these guys are in good cars, projected to do well. Why isn't, or why aren't, other people being owned? If everybody in these fields have a 65% chance of being wrecked, of not finishing the race, why is the field going 50% on Chase Elliott? Why is the field not playing BJ McLeod, who has been who has been running at the finish of Eaton? Where, where you at? Where you at? Good old Darwin. Where's Darwin at? who has been running at the finish of every single race, you know? <clears throat> it is even more imperative when we, or it's even more staggering when we look at the Xfinity series because then it's like big names carry the ownership. If you recognize the name, if you have a lot of history, if you have a lot of track finishes, if you like don't wreck out a lot, the ownership follows you to an even more uh, extensive degree. Parker Munt. Parker, 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 Parker Lehrman starting last. Jeremy Clements starting last. Carried ownership. Nobody wants to play CJ. Nobody wants to play Joey Gaze. Nobody wants to play Perkins. Josh Balicki. Ryan Ellis. Everybody plays Ryan Sieg, who's shown up in a lot of uh, optimals or who is able to finish races. This typically follows. If we go back and look here and look at how people are building lineups. And yet again, if you feel like I'm kind of like skipping over things or if you're like, what are you basing this off of? Yet again, uh, go to the description. I have it. I have my playlist of videos from like last like probably three years combined in there. And I've even cut content. I've really just tried to like here. This is exactly all the information you need to know entering these weekends. That's in the description of this video. But when you look at restrictor plate races for the Xfinity series, you're gonna see we'll we'll run uh, we'll run top tens as well. Although probably average finish would probably be a better indicator of where these people are. But you see. Ryan Seek. Let's do uh, let's do average finish. That might push things up more because we need to see uh, Jeremy Clements up there. Uh, yeah, okay. That's why top tens because we need people who have actually started a significant amount of races. So we have AJ, we have Sieg, we have Riley Herbst, we have Clements, we have Clickerman. Where's Clements at? Clem, Clem, Clem. Where you at? Clem, Clem. Clem, Clem. Where you at, my guy? Jeremy Clements. Ten races. Who he started every single race. That's why he's not showing up. He doesn't have a lot of top tens, but. Hey, you know, Clements has started in the back of the field multiple times, finishes in the top 20 pretty much a majority of the time, at least top 25. You know, like, we're not playing him here, we're not playing him here, we're not playing him here. Unlucky, got involved in a wreck. He worked, he worked, he worked, he worked, he worked, he worked. So we see ownership following very closely with previous finishes. That's why the ownership is here. That's why the ownership is at Sieg. That's why the ownership is at Kazgrala. We see that these drivers, we see, hey, Kyle Sieg right here. You know, this is what people pull from. This is how people build projections. This is how the optimizers build projections. Hey, you should play Jeremy Clements. Like, yeah, thank you. I, I kind of knew that. What else are we looking at? Kazgrala? We have Kazgrala, who started four races, who has been optimal in uh, multiple truck series events. <clears throat> And we see that he, hey, he typically finishes, excuse me, 
Uh, he typically finishes, you know, better than where he starts, or he's at least running up front in these races. A lot of people pay attention to that for whatever reason. Like, Xfinity people are like, well, I recognize these names. We're going to be overweight on them, but then they aren't um, overweight on, like, people. Like, why is Caesar, a man who has DNF'd a ton, okay, when we look at Caesar at these tracks, who has who has won me a lot of money when he actually does finish races and doesn't ass plow his own teammates look at this holy god this is insane this man is actually one of the dumbest people on the racetrack but man no ownership right here it's incredible man absolutely a winner and he typically still he doesn't kill you like nobody's playing these guys nobody's nobody's playing them so why would you even bother playing guys who are carrying ownership here Okay. Now, granted, yes, this is you know hindsight, twenty twenty. We can see what everybody scores. I haven't been talking about scoring it. I've literally just been talking about ownership. But when we look at people who are, and this is actually a bad example for Caesar because this is one of the ones where he did actually finish here. But when we look at uh, the points that these people actually score, and we look at the people who actually score points up here, and we look at them relative to ownership, why is Riley Herb starting fifteenth, twenty nine percent owned? Whereas nobody's even owned near 20% back here when these guys have a pretty much an exact chance of not finishing the race as Riley Herbst and an even greater chance of scoring similar or more points. 7.5, similar. Everybody else back here is similar to Riley Her or is more points than Riley Herbst, more points than Sam Mayer, more points, or not more points because Cole Custer finished and stuff. And, and so on and so forth and stuff like that. So when we look, and this is, like I said, I just literally have the stuff for the Cup Series. Um, when we look at lines, same thing for here, when we look at how these people score versus their ownership, like people, I just don't get it, man. You can easily project ownership. If you're building projections relative, like of how people should do in these races, you'll see who's going to pop up and optimize. You see who's going to pop up on the, in the sheets and stuff like that. It, it's so easy to do. I don't understand why there's such a discrepancy in this type of stuff. And then, like, uh, I believe this race didn't wreck a ton, or at least not a lot, because we had a lot of chalk come through. So when we look at Blaney, Elliott, Kyle Busch, Stenhouse, Jones, hey, Gillen, nearly all, you know, all good drivers, people coming from the back of the field and stuff. And you see that when I look at where I finished here, because I'm stacking guys from the back, and just to get different, like, there's, I'm not being, I'm being duplicated, but not even with the same lineups. We're just ending on the same um, points that these guys are making and stuff. It's just so easy to get different here. And I believe this is like the last one that actually cashes. I think, I forgot if 8,000, 8, I, I forgot if it's like 8,200 cash. I don't remember. All the other ones don't cash in this one for me. And yet again, this is entering with a certain understanding of how these races can go. When we look at races as a whole, and we look at, these were, when was this last edit? I believe this was entering last year. Yeah, this was entering last year. So when we look at this here, so this doesn't include last year's races, because, like, for me, I don't I don't need to do that. I already know the stuff. I Like, I don't need to worry about it. But when we look at the optimal lineups, and some people might be like, well, this doesn't include last year. This isn't accurate information, blah, 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 blah. Like, okay, I, I understand that argument if you want to make it. But these are the last 23 24 25 26 optimal lineups not including the 2023 races and outside of these four from 22 all these i randomized i purposely randomized them to show you how drastically different these races are how drastically different the lineups are and everything of that nature and the times that i do well because i approach these races the exact same no matter what weekend it is although typically the summer Daytona race, the summer Daytona weekend, and then the opening weekend for the 500 are the two highest likely uh, DNF rates. When we look at, let's zoom back in over here. When we look at the amount of DNFs, we typically see the Daytona races carry a significantly higher DNF percentage than Talladega. And due to that, we typically lose a lot of cars. A lot of people don't finish, excuse me. And so this blue line is just indicating half the field because a lot of people will be like, we need to stack from the back, but not all the back, whatever the case may be. I like to just 
identify twentieth on back as the back of the field, nineteenth uh, forward as the front of the field. Whenever you're building like a four two line, that's four guys from the back, two guys up front, three three, three guys from the back, three up front, five one, five guys from the back, one up front, whatever the case may be. And you start breaking it down in that regard, okay? We see that lineup, and yet again, these are optimal, not necessarily played lineups. We have individual races that are uncharacteristically green. We have individual races that are uncharacter or not even uncharacter uncharacter un what is the word? They're green, and then on the extreme side, we have complete you know shit shows to where the entire back of the field is optimal. That was the only way you could go. I typically lean and build this way regardless of the weekend because even outside of situations where the race actually goes green and nobody wrecks that's i'm not making any money those weeks that's just how it is i accept that but in my experience i have been able to cover any losses that i run into those weekends with the weekends where we actually have wrecks where guys from the back are going to work out when races actually have crashes and takes out the portion of the field that's up front as i said when you're thinking of projections and how these races play out we're not looking at the finishing order or at least i'm not i'm looking at where these guys are going to be running during these races where are the crashes most likely to happen when you look at those instances we see that the crashes start up front recently and you can't go from the back nearly as much like if you're playing guys who ride in the back you're they're committed to that. You can't, NASCAR, you are no longer able to ride in the back all day, drive up through the field. That's just how it is. And so we see guys fighting to get up front, guys fighting to stay up front, and we typically see the leader controlling whatever lane he's in or causing checkups or whatever. And so most crashes happen from the leader of either the inside lane or outside lane or just the leader in general going down to a lane. We see an accordion effect, and we typically see the third or fourth car in line that has that accordion effect or checkup happen get spun sideways and take people out. So we typically see crashes happening between like the 5th and 11th position, usually at any portion of the race. Now, yes, we still have like mid crashes and stuff, but when we're building lineups and trying to identify and understand why this type of ownership is so bad, if I can get there, this, where are we at here? This type of ownership is so bad to have on Hendrick guys, on good cars, because, hey, the Hendrick cars are going to be up front. They're going to be running up front. Now, Elliott is optimal in this instance. But look, Byron, Bowman, Chase Elliott. Byron, Bowman, Chase Elliott. Who the fuck is the fourth Hendrick car? Who is in the fourth Hendrick car? Oh, my Lord. I just went blank on who's in the fourth Hendrick car. Holy free holies. Who is in Byron? No, I have... Jeez, I can't for the life of me remember who's in the fourth Hendrick car. But those guys, oh, it's Larson. It's White Power Larson. So, like, the Hendrick cars are going to be running up front together. They're going to be running together, no matter typically where we're at. So, if there's a wreck in this instance, and these guys are running in the top ten, it's most likely going to take out one, if not two, of those guys. Could be more. And when we're having wrecks that are happening in this range with the people who should finish up front, well, that is going to clearly damage the high-owned lineups or the high-owned drivers because they're owned because they're going to be run up front all day, okay? And so I'm kind of all over the place, but uh, that's good. That's why I'm like, hey, if you want this stuff bro broken down, because I'm, I'm shoving a lot of information at you, check out the playlist in the description. But when we look at the optimal lineups and see how drastically different they are, and at the same time, good portion of these lineups are coming from the back half of the field. I just build that way. I just absolutely build from the back. Do you want to see how I build my lines? There's a video in that playlist just showing you how I build my lines from literally when I was an infant. <laughs> like Since I first started playing DFS, I've built the lines the exact same way. And they are centered around just targeting this back area. Okay? When we go ahead and start looking at this in practice and looking at this in terms of how you are actually performing yet again this is the big cup series contest and a race that i did not do well in okay because yet again we see all my lineups are not finished up front because i'm you know we have a lot of people who and this is typed less because we have some uh double stuff like mcdowell's 
twice too. That's why we sometimes see extra people, but it's still just six guys. It's still it's showing all the same lineups and stuff. Um, when we look at the lineups that won, you know, we're typically seeing a lot of, you know, popular plays come through. I don't play the popular plays, and I just pray to God that they wreck. So when we look here, you know, I'm nowhere even close to the front of the field or front of the pack. I'm like in the 3,000, 6,000, 66, 86. And I, as I said, I think that's my last one, my cash out of my 20 lineups that I played here. But I understand that going in. So that's 300 bucks in this one. That is 80 in the four. That is 20 in the one. There's a second 15. That's another $300. So that's like a 600, six, that's $700 typically on a Cup Series weekend that I have in my 20 lineups. And if nobody wrecks, then, I, then that, that doesn't count. Or it doesn't, it, it, you know, I'm not going to, I'm throwing that money away. I understand that going in. Where people get caught up is, ladies and gentlemen, these contests pay out 20% of the field. Two out of every 10 lines are going to cash. Okay, so we're already at a disadvantage as players entering these contests. We're entering a race to where 60% of the field has a chance of DNFing. Okay, so why would you, A, play safe here, B, play the guys that everybody else is playing, and C, not try and get different, okay? Outside of, because I've won regular truck and Xfinity Series contests over the years, but my biggest weekends have come from these individual, from the plate races, and I play the most money these four weekends a year. You know, in, in terms of my actual plate, I probably have 30, if not 33% of my overall play of the entire year on these four weekends okay and so when it doesn't work out i understand like we're gonna lose that but so this was in the spring didn't work out we didn't really do that well the day before this is the xfinity series contest from spring of last year and we look at the ownership where people are coming in because projections are regardless of where you're at projections are saying hey you should play parker you should play jeremy you should play uh Kaz Grawley, you should play Ryan Sieg, you should play uh, Josh Berry, Brandon Jones and stuff. Because if this race goes green, they're going to perform well. Their skill alone will cause them to perform well and stuff like that. And when we look at how the field actually ended up playing, and this is kind of a, a circle around to me because I, I don't do, like I don't post a lot of screenshots. I'm very quiet in terms of how the Patreon does and how the people do and stuff. But last year... This was a good one. You want me to count how many Patreon members last year finished in the top 50 here? Well, let's take a look. Well, first off, I finished fifth. These are where my line was finished. I finished fifth, 53rd, 94th, uh, 109th, 231, 373, 526, 602. And you got to remember, how many, how many people are in this contest? Uh, a little over 9,000, okay? So when we get... Races that actually cause people to wreck out, I typically cash. <laughs> like I, I do pretty fucking well. Okay, so these are my lineups: Sterling, SRT, Patreon member. So Patreon member, me, Sterling again. We have Sterling again. We have ASC, the guy who helped me uh, pull all this data for me during the off season. So Patreon member, hey. Sterling, Sterling, and like shout out to Sterling because I'll look at this in a second because I actually haven't gone through to see him, but he went 100% just on the stack from the back, which I don't understand. Like, look at these plays that I'm using. Nobody's using these guys. We're, we're using people who aren't even used at all. CJ, Caesar, Smithley, Gaze, Gray Golding, Ryan Ellis. What is the field doing? They're not playing any of these guys. You have to play ownership at these tracks. So anyway, we go through. We have ASC. We have Sterling. Sterling just killed the field. We have uh, JBC, who isn't a <clears throat> Patreon member, but we all know who JBC is. We, I believe this is uh, win the race, I win the race. Hey, here's Sheets. Hey, here's Sterling again. Hey, here's Sterling again. Uh, let's see. Let's see if we got Stuka somewhere here. Here's me again. Sterling again, who just killed the fucking field, who kicked everybody's ass here. Hey, here's Clive. Here's, uh, here's a Stukas. Another guy who actually knows what he's doing. Patreon member. Sterling again. Hey, here's ASC. You get, the, you get the point. I don't have to do this. I don't have to go through this. But when it goes well, like, you're going to be fine. We just need the one race. We got to remember there's 96 slates in a NASCAR season. We have four, eight, 
roughly 12 of those are on plate races. You just got to be aggressive, stack from the back, and when it works, and when everybody, because these, these drivers are absolutely horrendous. They don't practice anymore. They have one practice session. They're getting younger and younger. Do you think, realistically, because when we look specifically at the Truck Series and Xfinity Series, a lot of those kids are like 20, 19, 18, literal children in these cars going 200 miles an hour with no practice, very little practice. Do you think they're going to control these cars? No, they're going to wreck. They're going to cause wrecks. They're going to flip over. We want to root for that. We want to see that type of stuff. That's what we're rooting for, okay? I bring that up because the Cup Series, which is what most people focus on, we haven't seen that amount of DNF, DNFs in the last couple of races. Let's get back to the Cup Series real fast here. So we'll look at the last, we'll look at the races from last year. Because I got a lot of these questions. I got a lot of this stuff. And it always happens. It always ha it always happens. It goes full circle. We have a wreck, kind of like last year in the summer at Daytona. The entire field DNFs. Everybody dies. Nobody finishes this race. It's over. And then we go into the following race at Talladega. Everybody stacks in the back because they just saw it was out. They just saw it was optimal. They saw me win a lot of money back to back days. They're like, okay, we got to stack from the back. And then it doesn't work. And we see everybody migrates back to ownership, resulting in the popular, good projected plays being, being owned and other people not being owned where they should be. Like there's no reason ownership should be this low on these people. I just don't get it anyway. So let's go back here. Let's go back here. Let's look at the last four races last year. And, yes, the Daytona 500 has a lot of DNFs, you know. A lot of guys from the back are involved in these DNFs. It's a lot of idiots just piling into races. And so people who stacked from the back in the Daytona 500 last year and the Millionaire Maker last year and stuff. I forgot if I cashed. I'm pretty sure I did. I don't remember. Um, I know I cashed the first Millionaire Maker. But if you stack primarily from the back in the 30s, you landed on quite a lot of people who got involved in wrecks and or who – you know, you have Stenhouse coming through, but you have a lot of people who don't really gain a lot of positions. So people view this as, okay, stack from the back didn't work. Okay, we're going to try it again here at the Geico one, which, as I said, that's the contest we're just looking at here. And we see the stack from the back uh, not really work out because these people really don't gain a ton of positions. Now they do, but like, you know what I mean. It's not a straight stack from the back. So people are like less hesitant and stuff, but they're like, oh, it's going to work. And the summer race... In Daytona, it always does, and it does go through. Like, for me, I, I absolutely got cooked because I had so much Vernon pool. He was involved in a crash. He got moved. He, he finished dead last. And everybody else, yes, they do gain positions and stuff, but it wasn't as, or it wasn't the low-owned guys getting through. It was the guys you expect. Hey, here's uh, here's Corey LaJoy again, starting dead last, being off bull again. You know, you have Michael McDowell starting dead last, finishing 13th. He's carrying ownership and stuff like that. You know, and so the more this goes on and we're entering this type of stuff or we're entering we're entering this situation again to where like we ended at Talladega with a lot of people pissed off at how the stack from the back didn't live up to to the hype because these guys aren't these guys didn't end up wrecking nearly as much. When we look at the amount of people still running, it was very uh, or it was a lot of people. And so as this year went on. And it usually always happens over the course of a year. People will be like, Brandon, the stack from the back is just not working. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to start attacking the people who are projecting well and so on and so forth. And so when we're entering this day, 2500, I would look at the guys from the back probably being less owned than they should just in general because they always are, but probably more so because people are going to look back at how, how they performed last year and they're going to see, man, we really have to try and chase, or they're going to say, man, we really have to try and chase the optimal lineup. And the optimal lineups are hard to land because they look like this. They're just all over the damn place. This is so random. You ne it's so rare the optimal lineups even played at these races. I don't know why people are going to want to chase it. I don't know why people will attempt to, okay? They're like, well, when we look at the optimal lineups uh, and, you know, we typically see somebody from like the 13th to 7th position being optimal in every fourth race, we need to and then you just end up throwing those lineups away because that guy ends up underperforming or wrecking out and it kills the line. And uh, 
I think a big issue comes from, yet again, how easy it is to project these plate races. And what I mean by that is I, I hand build all of my lineups for these. I take a look at ownership and I just, I don't project ownership. I just do it in my head. Be like, mm, this guy will probably project well. And I feel that enough people don't do, oh, that's what I was going to look at Sterling real fast. So Sterling, you have to really, when I look at, we'll look at him first. How did this man go? So this man absolutely just crucifies the field. I mean, what an ass kicking. And you don't see, you didn't see me going on Twitter. You didn't see me doing this. I'm like, man, my guy kicked the shit out of the field. I didn't, like, bro, people, people know already. But like, what an incredible run here. That was like my run last year or the year before at Daytona. Look at this. This is like 11 lines in the top 100, 12 at 106. But the amount of the amount of time that this took to actually get the optimizer to do what you want, you have to make it use people that it doesn't want to use. So you either have to bump up that ownership or lock people out of the optimizer. Like we're we're mainly stacked in the back. So if you run an optimizer, the, the um, metaphor I would use, like you guys have all seen Scarface before, right? We. I want you to look at Tony Montana as an optimizer and Sosa as us, okay? We're telling Tony what to do. He's doing it. He's working great. He does everything we ask for. Everything is perfectly fine, okay? But we run the situations to where we run to plate races, Daytona 500s, etc. And we're telling Tony, look, we need to blow this car up, Tony. We need to blow this car up, okay? And Tony looks at us and there's like, there's kids in that car, bro. Why are we, we can't do that. The kids in the car are the bad drivers. The guys who are projecting bad, who are projecting poorly in comparison to higher projected people. For example, if you have Kyle Busch and Cody Ware is a race, and we have, oh man, who is, who's going to be in the 51? Probably not J.J. Yaley trying to think we have we have hmm, I'm trying to think here i'm trying to think of a big thing let's use chase elliott versus noah gregson okay similar ish cars let's say chase elliott starts 31st we have noah gregson starting 30th okay projections how people should finish in this race where they should be running in this race will lean towards chase elliott being played over noah gregson Okay, that's Tony just just telling us like, no, you got to play Chase Elliott. And we're like, nah, man, we got to go against the traditional way this optimizer works. We have to build bad, quote unquote, bad lineups with less projected return on value, with less projected or higher projected DK points in that lineup in order to get different, in order to have a real chance of winning. We have to play Noah Gregson, and then Tona, or Tona, and then, uh, you know, Montana just totally fucks over Sosa by killing Alberto in the car, and uh, that's the main thing that I, that I see projections run into, and so, like, Sterling, I, I should probably talk to him. I know what he did. I mean, this took forever actually getting it to play like these bad guys. You know, when you look at where the ownership comes into, this is actively telling the, the optimizers to not play the quote-unquote good lineups. Now, Cole Custer is optimal, not in the winning lineup, but Cole Custer's own 30%. Barry's own 41. You know, Jones is own 32. Ryan Sieg is own 52. This is actively telling the optimizer, or whatever thing he used to build his 150 lines, because I doubt he hand built 150. Unless he did, which shout out to you if you did that. But we're having to put in the quote unquote bad drivers because they're just on own compared to what they can do. And uh, I'm kind of going off on another tangent here. We've been here for like 40 minutes. Um, but yeah, man, like, dude, I just don't, I just don't understand where the disconnect is in these races, and specifically these races. I feel like they're easy to project for, 
because you know how people are going to run. You don't know where they're going to be involved in a wreck, if or not they get involved in a wreck, but you know where people are going to run. Just watch the races. It's the same people always up front. It's Junior Motorsports in the Xfinity Series always up front, and then they wreck each other because they're up front. They're trying too hard to work together. That's another thing. You, I can't get into that argument. I can't get into that tension again. If you've, if you've watched me a long time, you've heard me say it time and time again, if you don't race, you die. That's how it is, okay? You don't race 100%. You don't race for the win. You're dying. In junior motorsports, trying to work as a team, trying to plan everything out, they fucking wreck each other and they die. Dale Earnhardt, not racing for the win. He's racing for his team, blocking for his son and Mikey. He dies. Like, you don't race, you die. We've seen it. Colleague, you try and work together. <laughs> like, you, you try and just finish the race of you don't race, you die. Ross Chastain is not here to work as a team. He's here to race, and he wrecks the other colleague cars like a couple years ago in Xfinity Series. It happens all the time. We want people. You're projecting people based on how they can perform in these races, based on how they run, how they get through the field, where they're at in these running, where they're at in these racing, where are they at, where, where they're at in these races. I just, anyway. Anyway, we're going on. We've been here for like 40 minutes. Um, yet again, if you want a, I guess a better breakdown, feel free to check the playlist out in the uh, description, and uh, I'm sure we'll be talking more about this. If you guys want anything specifically talked about, feel free to reach out, and I'll, I'll cover it past that. I'm just going to be like, man, check this out, check this out, check this out. Here, like, I just, you know, <laughs> I've been talking about this stuff for, for years now, and it's not that I don't like it. It's just that I don't know what you guys want to hear or what you don't want to hear. I'm trying to look at things in a different light compared to how I've normally done it. But, uh, works, man. Just stack from the back. Boy, I think this is like 1,100, 1,300 on like a 300 entry for me. Like, no, it'd be 200, probably 280. Three, no, it'd be 300. So we have the $10. No, this is 15 lineups. So that was 150. Oh, God. 170 $185 entry for me for this Xfinity series rate. 15 in the 10, 15 in the 4, 15 in the 1. And I'm pretty sure this is probably like a $1400 return or somewhere around that. I know it's over a thousand. Like it's worth it. It this makes up for pretty much all the races the rest of the season not being gigantic wreckfests or being wreckfests and having the guys in the back be involved. Like you, it, at least for me, it evens out and ends up still being in the green no matter what happens. I don't know. That's uh, that's my two cents. I just uh, I just like talking about this stuff, man. I love analyzing these races. I love analyzing new stuff. So I will uh, see you guys in the next video, and uh, hopefully you like it.